I am talking to a friend on Facebook and he's getting back in the gym after years of doing nothing. And he says he's demotivated. It's not as easy as it once was. He thinks he still looks a mess. He's not sure what to focus on. And he asked me, you got back into it, any advice? And I said, yeah, take a step back. We can talk about the specifics on how to train, but first, sort your head out, approach it the right way. And we discussed five things, which I'm gonna go through here because they seemed to make sense to him. So hopefully anyone watching this will get something from the video, but primarily it's gonna be aimed at those of you either returning to working out, having not done so for a while, or starting to work out for the first time, and perhaps thinking, in the words of the boss, maybe we ain't that young anymore. And he wrote that at 25 and had a point. Once you are pushing 30, you are past some peaks. There may be things that you will never be able to do as well as you did in previous years. And there may be things that had you done them in previous years, you would have reached a higher level than you would ever do starting them now. Missed peaks of opportunity, if you like. My first point is gonna cover why that just doesn't matter, but it does make sense to approach your training with an awareness of the fact that you're not 18 and the implications of that. Number one, no regrets. It is so easy to find yourself thinking, I wish I had done this sooner. I was pushing 40 before I lost 100 pounds in weight that I didn't need. And I spent a long time kicking myself that I hadn't sorted myself out earlier. And even now I've still fallen into that regret trap. I discovered 12 months ago that I'm okay riding a bike and it crosses my mind. I wish I'd done this when I was 27 or even 37, not 47. And every time that happens, I have to stop myself because those sort of regrets where you've got yourself somewhere better and then regretting not having done it sooner or younger or whatever, they are nonsense. One, unless you have a DeLorean, they are completely irrelevant anyway. Two, they are negative thoughts resulting from a positive improvement, which is the equivalent of winning a race and then punching yourself in the face for having done so. <laughs> Surprise me. And three, and this applies just generally to any sort of regrets about anything, you have no idea whether what you wished could have happened would have actually resulted in a better outcome anyway. It's like those stupid game shows where there is an amount of money from one pound to a million pound in 10 boxes, and you have to pick a box. I'm gonna open it. And the one you pick has 750,000 in it. And then you regret not having picked a different box where you might have got the million, where you might have got the pound. So yes, you could have joined a gym 10 years ago and got in shape sooner. Or you could have got knocked down by a bus on your way there for your very first session. Life is way too varied and complicated to second guess what might have been. If you are alive and well today, because many people aren't, then every decision you ever made has led to you being alive and well today and able to make new and maybe better decisions today. Given how many dangerous buses are driving around, then alive and well today will do just fine. And dangerous buses is a metaphor. I don't mean to suggest bus paranoia is a good thing to adopt. So do not waste a second on regretting stuff. Instead, spend that time on moving forward from where you are now. Number two, no one cares what you look like. Let me not sugarcoat this for you. You will often be told that no one is watching you when you jog, when you first start jogging, and it looks closer to dying than exercise. You'll be told that when you walk in the gym for the first time, and you could not look more like a gym newbie if you carried a sign saying, I'm a gym newbie, that no one will even notice you. But those things aren't true. When I started jogging and going back to the gym at 330 pounds in weight and six foot six, People noticed me. Parents with kids in pushchairs on the pavement would step into the road when I ran past because I assume they thought that was probably safer for all concerned. So don't expect to be invisible. But all those people that will notice you could not give a shit. My very first park runs, when I was lumbering along at the back, I thought everybody must be thinking, what the hell does he look like? Don't look at it. Shut your eyes, Mary, and don't look at it no matter what happens. Five years later, when I was coming in the top 15 or 20 runners, it dawned on me that no one's looking at anyone, which was much to my annoyance then because I was in the top 15 or 20 runners. Despite still being very large, I wanted people to come up to me and say, hey, we noticed you, you're doing a great job, big man. But no one does because no one cares. The same in the gym. I spent the first couple of years avoiding eye contact with the mirror because I didn't want to be reminded of how I appeared to everyone else there. The other day, I came home from the gym and Jenna asked if the gym was busy. I'd been in there for one hour and I couldn't even remember if there had been one other person there or 10. 
I know it wasn't empty because when it's empty, I grab a cheeky snap for Instagram. But beyond that, not a clue. And certainly no idea whether the other people that were there, if there were any, were big or small or male or female or this or that. The only time recently that I can even remember giving thought to another person in the gym was when the only other guy there was on the treadmill and he was a big guy, probably three or four stone overweight, and he was doing intervals, sprint, rest, sprint, and crushing it, high intensity interval training, the way it is supposed to be done. And I can remember thinking, literally, that guy is crushing that workout. If he's aiming to lose weight, he is 100% doing that the right way. And then I got on with whatever I was doing. But the only reason I even noticed him was because he was someone doing a decent workout and that stood out way more than his appearance. Dear God, it's beautiful. Number three, get active rest. My kid is 17, six foot seven, lifts weights, does a similar weights program to me actually, we don't rest the same. His idea of rest is to get home at one in the morning and not stay out all night. And it doesn't matter because he's 17. When he's 27, he won't be able to do that. He will need to factor in, if he's being sensible, proper rest for a proper duration of time. Otherwise, overtraining, burnout, injury will follow. What I have found getting back into training in my 40s was that I need more than that. I need active rest. Just doing nothing is not enough. So on my rest days, I'll use a sauna, I'll get a massage, I'll do some foam rolling, I'll go for a gentle walk and then stretch. I even took up yoga. Just resting and thinking that's enough, that's like parking a car for the week and thinking that's the same as getting it serviced. No, in between driving it, you've got to be checking the tire pressure, you've got to be checking the oil, having the mechanic look over it now and then. And the older the car, the more important that is. Because when you are older, not only are you more prone to injury, injuries take an annoyingly longer time to recover from. A few weeks ago, I went to the gym. I was planning to do a back workout. I was gonna start with some deadlifts. I get there and there's a guy on the squat rack already. So while I'm waiting for him, I think I'll do a few sets of pull-ups just as a warm-up. Quite how doing a pull-up at 230 pounds is a good warm-up, I don't know. Anyway, first set, rep six, something goes tweak in my back and that ruined the day's training. In fact, not just that, the next six or seven days I was waking up every morning with real discomfort in my back where it tightened up overnight. In fact, it was only a couple of days ago that I was actually able to do a heavy back workout without pain. Now that is actually less an example of why active rest is important and more an example of why you shouldn't just be an idiot but it is a good indication of how, even for someone that is training on a regular basis, my body is just more fragile now than it was 20 or 30 years ago. So look after it. Number four, be the best version of you. No, don't. My aim with anything that I do that I want to do well at is to try and end up above average. When you are below average, that is a realistic target. And if you get there, it puts you better than most. And that's a nice psychological place to be. It also doesn't require the commitment and the compromise necessary to excel, to be the best, which means you can still fit in other aspects of your life around your health and fitness training, your children, your job, your partner, your pets, whatever. And as you're working your way up to above average, it's easy to assume that when you do get there, you'll be content with that achievement, and many people are. But if you are somebody competitive by nature, then you may find yourself frustrated at your slowing improvements. I know in my park runs in the early years, I'd be knocking off big chunks of time every time I ran until I was running pretty quick, and then those improvements stopped happening, and on occasion, I'd go backwards. I found that recently with my cycling in here. Last year, I got better and better and better with every single ride. This year, those newbie gains have stopped and getting better has become an awful lot harder and a couple of weeks of not focused on training will see me go backwards quick. And when that happens, it's important to remind yourself that you are still above average. Could you be better? Probably, but at what price? I am not the best version of a 5K runner, a park runner that I could be. I run a 1930, which for some of my size is pretty good, but it's not the best I could be. I could run under 19 minutes by the end of this year. I might be able to knock a minute off my best time. But to achieve that would require a commitment of time and energy that would be significant. It would cause huge compromise elsewhere. My other sports and hobbies would suffer, not to mention my normal home life. The comedian Louis C.K. has a funny bit about going to the doctor with a bad ankle once he's over the age of 40. And the doctor just tells him, yeah, you just got a shitty ankle. That's just now what you have until you're dead. And Louis says, hang on a minute, there's nothing that medical science can do. You, there's no way that you can fix that somehow. What if I was an athlete? And the doctor says, whoa, you're not an athlete. So no to whatever you're about to ask. 
Now, I do regard myself as an athlete, but there are times when I'm stupidly contemplating compromising other aspects of my life in order to increase my performance in one area that I've just become hooked on, or I'm simply feeling frustrated that I'm not where I want to be. And on those occasions, I'll tell myself, you're not an athlete. Have a Coke and a smile, watch some Netflix. You don't need to be the best version of you. You need to be above average and the most content version of you. Number five, calories in, calories out, plus diet. And lastly, nutrition. Sometimes I assume everyone must know the basics by now. And then yesterday, I was listening to a radio show, a phone in about obesity, and the level of knowledge from the people phoning in and the presenter taking the calls on really, really simple, fundamental basics around diet and health was staggeringly non-existent. So given that the majority of people are overweight, and therefore if you're thinking of getting back into working out or starting afresh, then a large percentage of you may have that issue as well, as I certainly did, I thought I'd wrap this up by just touching on this point. Understand that too much fat is related to too much food, calories. Not even too much bad food, just food. You can eat 10,000 calories a day of healthy meals, you'd be fat. And exercise to correct excess food consumption is like saving a sinking ship by bailing water out with a coffee mug. Theoretically possible, but I'm not going boating with you unless you agree it is better to fix the gigantic amount of water flooding in instead. One of the callers to the phone-in said he was three stone overweight because his five-a-side football game had been cancelled during the lockdowns. No, he's not. It's too much food. What you do or don't do for an hour each week is irrelevant compared to the steady stream of calories that you consume every single day, all day. And the reason this section is called calories in, calories out plus diet is because there has been a polarization of dietary advice lately that seems to be either people saying it's calories in, calories out solution, like that's it. They just somehow solved the obesity epidemic with four words. And they say calories twice. It's really only three words. Or... People saying you need to eat keto or carnivore or vegan or intermittent fasting or paleo or one meal a day. It's all about the diet. And by diet, I mean things you eat. My dog has a diet. You have a diet. I have a diet. I don't use the word to describe restrictive eating. But those two positions pitched against each other make no sense. Calories in, calories out is factually correct. Consume more than you burn equals store fat. Consume less than you burn equals use fat to make up the shortfall. But that knowledge alone isn't enough. It is like saying that airplanes fly because of the forces of lift exceeding gravity. That is true, but if you tell someone you're on a holiday to Greece and they say, how are you getting there? And you go, oh, I'm lift versus gravity. They'll think you're an idiot. They want to know if you're flying BA, business or economy, extra leg room seats. They don't want you going goodwill hunting on them and starting to scribble a formula on a blackboard. So how you eat, the diet you choose to follow, your eating plan, whatever name you want to give to describe shoveling food into yourself, whether it is any of those that I mentioned, it needs to adhere to the calories in, calories out formula. But whether you stick with it is based on whether it is a sustainable, enjoyable way of eating. For example, a ketogenic diet with the right calorie in, calorie out numbers will work for fat loss. But you won't stick to it if you hate that way of eating. It is a plane that flies with a rubbish in-flight movie choice and uncomfortable seats. Equally, a diet that you love but doesn't stack up on the numbers that is flying first class in a plane with no wings. So understand, calories in, calories out needs to underline what you do and then select a way of eating that you can maintain. Okay, I am done. Hopefully those five things were useful. If you're getting back into training and you've got some questions that I didn't go through, then stick them in the comments and I can perhaps cover them in a future video. Equally, if I covered something and you think oh, I disagree with that, stick that in the comments too. Let's have a debate about it. Like and subscribe, get notified of future videos by doing that and I am out of here.